have a question and answer portion. So firstly, the book overview. So to understand this book and what I attempt to accomplish with this book, we have to start at the beginning with Richard Allen himself. Now, much of what I'll be talking about here is familiar to you at Bridge Street, but this just helps to contextualize what my book is about. So as we know, Richard Allen founded the AME Church. He was born on February 14th, so we both have the same birthday. So February 14th, 1760 in Philadelphia. He was enslaved by Benjamin Chu and then Stokely Sturgis of Dover, Delaware. When Sturgis fell on hard economic times, he sold Allen's relatives. So although Allen referred to Stokely Sturgis as a good master, it still did not you know, prevent Sturgis from selling Allen's own family members. Understandably, after this familial disruption, Allen was you know, very disturbed by this, very depressed by this. And in 1877, after this occurred, he became a Methodist. And as a devoted Methodist, he invited Methodist preachers to Stokely Sturgis's farm, which Sturgis encouraged and allowed. In fact, one of Freeborn Garrison's sermons convicted Sturgis. And afterwards, Sturgis agreed that slavery was wrong. He could not you know, accept in his heart that he continued to own slaves. And so he permitted Allen and Allen's brother to purchase their freedom for $2,000 in continental money. So although he was convicted that slavery was wrong, he did not free them on the spot, but rather they had to earn the money to gain that freedom. And so in this way, Methodism provided Allen not only a way to become free spiritually, but also in actuality by giving him the opportunity to purchase his freedom. So Allen accomplished this goal in 1783. He purchases his freedom from Stokely Sturgis and then begins his career as a traveling preacher. And he spends several years traveling in Pennsylvania, Delaware, New Jersey, New York, Virginia, Maryland, North Carolina, and South Carolina. And also what is less well-known is that during this period of his early ministry, he spent about two months evangelizing among indigenous people, showing that from the beginning of his ministry, he included indigenous people in his purview when he thought about the Methodist movement and who should be a part of it. So in 1784, the Methodists in the United States held a conference. So prior to this time, Methodism had been expanding throughout the Atlantic world. It originated, of course, in England. But after the revolution, after the United States became its own independent country, Methodists in America said, well, since we are now independent from England, we really should have our own Methodist organization. So in 1784, they established the Methodist Episcopal Church during the so-called Christmas Conference in Baltimore, Maryland. And Allen, who was very much a part of the real origins of the Methodist movement in America, he attended this important conference as well. But at this conference, he started to notice some changes in the Methodist that he knew. So he says in his life experience and gospel labors that many of the ministers were set apart in holy orders at this conference and were said to be entitled to the gown. And I have thought religion has been declining in this church ever since. So what Alan is noticing at this conference is that the Methodists are starting to show some of the pretensions, if you will, of the Anglican church, wanting to be entitled to the gown, wanting to be set apart in holy orders. And this was a departure from what he had witnessed in the early Methodist movement, which was remarkably egalitarian. That's part of what attracted Allen to this denomination. People didn't put on airs, they wore you know, a simple black suit and they were really preaching to everybody for everybody. 
And so when Alan starts to see the Methodists at this Christmas conference changing that, he is alarmed. In February of 1786, Alan returns to Philadelphia after you know, many years of traveling and attending that Christmas conference. And he began to regularly preach at St. George Methodist Episcopal Church, where he attracted a significant African-American audience. And the white Methodists at this church began to be concerned with the growing number of African Americans who were attending. And although they, you know, certainly allowed Allen to continue preaching, they wanted Blacks to start sitting in a separate section, which of course goes absolutely against the sort of egalitarianism that Allen had originally seen in the Methodist movement. And so, as we all know, in November of 1787, Allen, Absalom Jones, and others were attending Sunday services at the St. George Church. And trustees attempted to physically move them from their knees saying, no, you can't pray here. No, you can't be here. And so Allen goes from being alarmed at the Christmas conference to being really upset at what he is seeing here. This is not Christian. And it is certainly not Methodist. This is not the Methodism that he had converted to all those years ago. So Allen leaves the church, never to return. And what's important to note here is that Allen wasn't just upset at the behavior of these white trustees at the church because it was racist. Of course, it offended him on that level. But it also upset him because it went against Methodism's tradition of egalitarianism and inclusivity. And so this is the critical point that again, of course he's offended as a black person, but he's also upset because to him, it represents a decline in genuine Methodism and genuine Christian religiosity. And so he has to reckon with what he thinks the next step should be moving forward. So in 1781, again, as we know, he buys the lot at 6th and Lombard Street, wanting to build a house of worship for African Americans. He later moves a blacksmith shop to that lot. They dedicate that building and name it Bethel. Bishop Francis Asbury dedicates the church on July 29th, 1794. And so now the Black Methodists who felt you know, really offended and really pushed out of St. George's now they will have a place to worship where they feel that they will not be discriminated against. And it's a place where they can genuinely reflect on and worship God. Membership at Bethel continued to grow, but the Methodist Episcopal Church was not really willing to let it go. And so over the course of many years, Methodist, the Methodist Episcopal Church tries to exert control over Bethel. But then finally, in 1816, after a contentious legal battle, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court sides with Bethel and declares it independent from the Methodist Episcopal Church. So Allen and the Methodists at Bethel have been victorious. They have won their independence from the Methodist Episcopal Church. Then in April of 1816, Allen holds a meeting at Bethel of other Black Methodists who have felt discriminated against and who were you know, upset with the way they've been treated by whites. And so they all meet at Bethel and together decide to form their own denomination, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And Allen was elected and consecrated as the first bishop of this new denomination. And so here's the critical point for my book. So in creating the AME Church, Allen was hoping to correct what he thought had gone wrong in the Methodist movement. He wanted his denomination to genuinely be racially and ethnically inclusive. That was what he had seen in early Methodism. That was what attracted him to the denomination in the first place. And he included indigenous people within his purview because again, as I mentioned before, in his early ministry, he was already reaching out to and evangelizing among indigenous people. And so that openness, that intercultural openness 
is really imbued in the history of African Methodism from the very beginning. And so my book argues that the AME Church pursued evangelism within diverse native communities throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries, and that this was not an aberration. This was not something outside of what was normal. Rather, these actions fulfilled Richard Allen's vision of creating a racially and ethnically inclusive Methodist institution. And in the book, I look at how this evangelism unfolded both in the North and in the West among the so-called five civilized tribes. So let me just make this a little larger. So this is the table of contents for the book. So in chapter one, I talk about Richard Allen and his experiences with indigenous people. I talk about John Stewart and Jarena Lee and how they contribute to really making outreach to indigenous people foundational in the AME church. In chapter two, where much of this presentation is going to come from, I talk about two indigenous ministers, Thomas Sunrise, who was an Oneida, and John Hall, who was an Ojibwe. And I look at how their AME ministries reflect what Allen's vision was for the AME church to be an inclusive organization. And then the other chapters look more at the West. So in terms of our purposes today, we'll be discussing materials out of chapter two. Okay, so that's the general book overview. And now I'm going to focus on Thomas Sunrise, this really fascinating figure who I uncovered in my research for this book. So first let's talk about his early life and ministry. So Thomas Sunrise becomes the first native minister ordained within the AME church. And in fact, he was probably the first native minister ordained in any historically black religious body. And what makes him unique among indigenous clergy as a whole is that while there were indigenous ministers in various denominations, they typically worked within white organizations. So for example, Samson Occam, who is pictured here, he was Mohegan and he worked through the Presbyterian church. William Apis, who was a Pequot, he worked through the Methodist Episcopal Church. So you do see indigenous clergy in this period, but they typically worked among, uh, worked within predominantly white denominations. Thomas Sunrise is different because he is working within a historically black denomination. So Thomas Sunrise was also known as Tewiskarga, and he was born in 1829 in Utica, New York. He was a member of the Oneida Nation, which was one of the six nations of the Haudenosaunee. And you may be more familiar with the term Iroquois. So the Haudenosaunee were a very long-standing uh, confederacy of five nations and then later six nations living in what is now upstate New York and also Canada. And so the Oneida, their historical uh, lands were located in this region of what is now New York. So Thomas Sunrise, who's also known as Thomas Sunrise Dana, was born in near Utica, New York in 1829, a member of the Oneida Nation, one of the six nations of the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois Confederacy. He converted to Christianity at a young age. His mother was a Christian and he himself had what he described as really a divine revelation, a divine experience himself that compelled him to become a Christian. So he later explained that he was in the woods one day. He was very down, very depressed about all of the upheaval that his own community was enduring because of the US government's you know, interventions. And he was very depressed. And then at some point, he heard a loud voice from heaven and saw a great ball of fire. And this experience helped compel him to convert to Christianity. And again, as I mentioned before, his mother was already a Christian. So that probably made it 
easier for him to make that transition. Early on in his ministry, he was really traveling a great deal. He didn't settle down at a pastorate for you know, many years. So he preached throughout the 1850s in areas in the Northeast and in the Mid-Atlantic region. And during the course of these, uh, over the course of his itinerant ministry, he became familiar with the network of independent black churches that were being established all throughout these regions. Philadelphia, for example, had 18 independent black churches at this time, including of course, Bethel AME Church, which we all know and love as Mother Bethel, but also churches like First African Presbyterian Church. So here's a picture of Bethel, and here's a picture of First African Presbyterian. So First African Presbyterian was founded by John Gloucester, who was a former slave and a contemporary of Richard Allen. And by the time Thomas Sunrise was preaching and, and doing his itinerant ministry, First African was without a pastor. And so throughout those several years, you know, you would have guest preachers come in on various Sundays to preach for the congregation. And in 1852, Thomas Sunrise was one of those preachers. So his sermon has not survived, so we don't know exactly what he would have said, but it's interesting to think about what he may have expressed to this congregation. So at this point in the 1850s, and I'll talk a bit more about it later, African Americans were in a very you know, precarious situation. The Fugitive Slave Act has passed and is really wreaking havoc upon Black communities. Maybe Thomas Sunrise spoke to that. Maybe he talked about the, the discrimination that indigenous people have faced and how in that way they are very similar to black people. So again, his sermon has not survived, but it's interesting to think about what he might have said at this point. So although his sermon has not survived, he did write a poem that has survived. And it gives some insight into what his thought process was, what was on his mind in this time period. And this poem is at Brown University. So we'll look at this and take a gander at what he was saying. So in this, The Indian's Lament, his poem, he's talking about how upsetting it is that indigenous people have been displaced and treated so poorly in their own home country. So for example, he says, alas, said the Indian, I once had a home and a fair forest shade where the wild deer could roam, where the sachem could feast on the festival day, but the steel of the white man has swept them away. I once had a father who watched o'er my youth and a mother who taught me the precepts of truth. Their spirits have vanished and cold is their, and cold is their clay for the steel of the white man has swept them away. And then the very last stanza, he says, and I must soon follow the great spirit's call away to the land where the brave never fall to that bright blissful home, to the fair forest shade where the steel of the white man can, ne can never invade. So that gives an indication of some of what was on his mind in this time period. So certainly He's reflecting upon what has happened to indigenous people. And it's possible that he may have shared some of that perspective in that sermon at First African Presbyterian. So then around 1852 in Maryland, Thomas Sunrise met an AME minister named Robert A. Johnson. And the two men began traveling and evangelizing together. And Alexander Wayman noted this relationship in his Cyclopedia of African Methodism. So you can see here, it says at the bottom, Robert A. Johnson, a member of the Ohio Conference was born in Maryland where he spent his youth. After his conversion, he went out as, evan as, as an evangelist with Thomas Sunrise, the Indian preacher. So he gives an indication of their uh, relationship as traveling ministers together. And so Sunrise's time with Robert Johnson was probably his first 
uh, sustained contact with an African Methodist. So he certainly had been introduced to the idea of independent black churches, but this was probably his first sustained contact with an AME. And so their connection, it's certainly likely that during the course of their travels, Johnson told him about the AME church and Sunrise likely got the impression that, okay, this is a denomination in which I would be welcome. So around 1853, Thomas Sunrise moves to New Bedford, Massachusetts, and was ordained at the predominantly white Middle Street Church. Then about a year later, he accepted his first pastoral appointment, this time at the predominantly black Third Christian Church in New Bedford. So he spent you know, the first many years of his ministry uh, traveling. And so the first pastorate he has is a black church. Third Christian Church in New Bedford, Massachusetts. And then between 1854 and 1855, Sunrise left Third Christian to affiliate with the AME Church in New Bedford. And so it's likely, again, that after his experience with Robert A. Johnson, he always remembered that the AME Church was an option, and he evidently got to know some of the people at the AME Church in New Bedford, and then ultimately joins with them. So he attended quarterly conference and received a preaching license. And then in 1855, he attended the New England annual conference meeting in Providence, Rhode Island, seeking formal ordination. And so I've included here those very minutes that talk about Thomas Sunrise. So here you can see the minutes of the third annual conference of the New England district and it occurred in Providence, Bethel Church in Providence in 1855. And so if you look all the way at the bottom here where it says certificate, it starts listing all the people who are seeking their certification, their preaching license. And then if you go to the top of this other page, you can see Thomas Sunrise here. So it says, JDS Hall presented the petition and certificate of Reverend Thomas Sunrise to be admitted into the itineracy. On motion, voted that the Reverend Thomas, Sunrise, Thomas Sunrise's petition be received. And so Thomas Sunrise is admitted, and you can see that history in these fantastic annual conference minutes, which holds so much fascinating information, certainly for the First Episcopal District. Bishop Willis Nazary was the presiding bishop over this meeting, and so he's the one who ordains Thomas Sunrise to the itineracy, and he's pictured here, Bishop Nazary. And so Sunrise becomes the first Native minister ordained in the AME Church, and Nazary gives him his first pastoral assignment as an AME to the main mission in Portland, Maine. So Sunrise spends about a year pastoring at this church in Portland, and then he attends the next New England annual conference meeting in 1856 in Boston. And now that he is you know, ordained, now that he's in, he's able to play a more active role in this meeting than he did in the previous one. So he serves in the Committee on Orders and participates in examining other ministers who were seeking ordination. And so this here just shows his name on the roll. So these are the annual conference minutes from the New England annual conference meeting in Boston in 1856. And here you can see Thomas Sunrise on the list of ministers who answered their roll call. So also now that Thomas Sunrise is you know, ordained and he's in the denomination, He's also able to participate in really significant uh, meetings, including one in Canada. So in September 1856, he travels to Chatham, Ontario, and attends the Canada Annual Conference meeting. A few months before that, the Canadian churches had successfully petitioned to break off from the AME Church and establish the British Methodist Episcopal Church because they felt that there just was no you know, real future in the United States, the Fugitive Slave Act had passed, and they felt that they would fare better under British rule than under the United States. 
And so they were given permission to break off and form the BME church. And I've included just a BME certificate down here just to show you what that looks like. And so at this meeting in Chatham in September, 1856, Sunrise helps to manage this separation. And he does so alongside some people who I'm sure you've heard of, Bishop Daniel A. Payne and several others. And so together with Payne and the others on this committee, Sunrise decides that Bishop Nazri, the one who had ordained him, would take jurisdiction over the BME church. And so the BME church later returns to the AME denomination several decades later. But again, here you see Sunrise playing an important role in this significant moment in AME history. And so this just shows that meeting, that, that committee that he was on for that purpose. So it says, you know, this general conference does not feel authorized to give one of its bishops to that portion of the connection, unsolicited therefore, resolved that when we shall be solicited for one, all our bishops shall meet with three elders selected by them and decide which of the bishops shall serve Canada. And so that is what this, this meeting is for, that Sunrise is a part of. And they agree. We say in obedience to the above resolution and decree of the general conference, and also the resolution of the BME church, et cetera, et cetera, that we, the undersigned, met in the church at Chatham, having duly considered the important questions submitted to us, we have concluded to decide that it will be Bishop Nazri who will take over the BME church. And so it's signed by Daniel Payne, Richard Warren, Thomas Sunrise, and Elisha Weaver, who apparently did not agree. So after attending this meeting in Canada, Sunrise relocates to Ohio and joins the Ohio Annual Conference. And he pastors there from 1856 to 1859 at an AME church in Cleveland. And included here is an advertisement that ran in the Cleveland Leader newspaper, an ad for his church services to encourage folks to come. So it says Bolivar Street, ME African Church, uh, Reverend Thomas Sunrise Pastor, services at 2.30 and 7 o'clock in the evening. So here he is advertising his church and his services and really putting on display that here is this indigenous minister of this African-American church. And so this would, you know, attract other potential members. Sunrise had a falling out with some AME ministers and temporarily withdrew from the denomination. And so in the 1860s and 1870s, he goes and joins various other denominations, including the AME Zion Church. He also displayed an interest in evangelizing in Europe. It's unclear if he ever did so, but I've included his passport application here showing his desire to do so. And so this passport application also describes his physical appearance. So as I mentioned before, he was sometimes known as Thomas Sunrise Dana. So it says that here, it says he's 53 years, excuse me, 43 years old. He's five foot five inches high. His eyes are dark brown. He has a Grecian nose and so on and so on, explaining the way he looks. And it also indicates on here that his desire was to go to Europe and evangelize. So Sunrise resumed his ministry in the AME church in the 1880s and pastored churches in Rhode Island and Connecticut as evidenced by the newspaper clipping I've included here. So talking about Reverend Thomas Sunrise, a full-blooded Indian and once medicine man of the Oneida tribe, he is pastoring a colored church in Putnam, Connecticut and it is a Methodist church. So it's not clear when he passes away but I'm still seeing uh, advertisements for him and his church services into at least 1891. So assuming that he, he dies sometime after 1891, but up until that time, uh, he was still pastoring various Amy churches in New England during that time period. Okay, so then now, so that is his general life in ministry, gives you an idea of what the sort of the outline of his life is. So now part three, Thomas Sunrise and Oneida AME Abolitionist. 
So as I previously mentioned, Thomas Sunrise joined the AME Church in the 1850s. And this is a particularly perilous time for African Americans because it is throughout the 1850s that the US government on many levels is indicating to African Americans that freedom is not coming, uh, relief is not coming. The Fugitive Slave Act is passed in 1850, causing African Americans to you know, really run for their lives to Canada and other places. You have the Kansas Nebraska Act, the Dred Scott Supreme Court decision, and various other events that occur throughout the 1850s that make many African Americans feel as if slavery would just be here forever, that it would be here to stay, and that no matter how hard we try, you know, these forces are just too powerful. But so this is when Thomas Sunrise is, is joining the Amy Church at a time when African Americans are really, you know, trying to keep pushing back and trying to uh, push forward the cause of abolition. And I argue in the book that these events struck a particular chord with Thomas Sunrise. And it's because of what was happening to indigenous people at this time as well. So Thomas Sunrise is born during the removal era. So basically in the 1830s, the US government was forcing indigenous people to leave their homelands and move west of the Mississippi River. And so this kind of displacement it certainly happened to the Oneida. It was happening to many other indigenous nations. We are more familiar with it in terms of the Trail of Tears and how it affected the Cherokee Nation, but this is happening to all indigenous nations living east of the Mississippi. And so Thomas Sunrise, he's growing up in that, that fact of the US government interfering in the lives of indigenous people, forcing them to move somewhere else. So that looks pretty similar to what the Fugitive Slave Act does in the 1850s. It is intruding into the lives of African-Americans, forcing them to go somewhere else, whether it's further down South or for those who were trying to get away, forcing African-Americans to run to Canada or elsewhere. So as I indicated in the previous section, he personally witnessed how the Fugitive Slave Act was compelling AMEs in Canada to say, you know what, we just wanna separate from the United States. So again, in the book, I argued that his experiences as an indigenous person growing up in the removal era made him particularly sensitive and empathetic to what African-Americans were going through at this point. And so I argue that he was attracted to the AME church because of its strong and unequivocal abolitionist stance and all that the AME Church did to forward the cause of abolition. Because again, he could have joined any number of white denominations, but he deliberately chose the AME Church because I argue he believed in this cause of abolition. So in the very first AME discipline, it stated that we will not receive any person into our society as a member who is a slaveholder. So that is you know, put in the very beginning of, of AME history and our AME discipline. And so again, I believe Thomas Sunrise agreed with that stance and was uh, compelled by it. And then of course you have other important aspects of AME history where we see the cause of abolition. Denmark Vesey, of course, in South Carolina who organizes a slave revolt that ultimately does not succeed, but it is enough to terrify the white residents of South Carolina and kind of run AMEs out of there. And then also you have the history of the AME church participating in the Underground Railroad. The church I grew up in, Israel AME Church in Albany, New York, was a stop on the Underground Railroad, as were many other AME churches. So you have all of this rich history of abolitionism in the denomination, and Thomas Sunrise was attracted to that. And so, he is, his first pastoral appointment in the AME Church is in Portland, Maine. And Portland, Maine, because of its proximity to Canada, it was, you know, really a, a hotbed of abolitionist activity. And it was really a place where a lot of freedom seekers came to. And they sought the support of people like Reuben Ruby, who owned a cab stand, and he would help spirit away people to freedom and he would help you know, disguise them and all that. 
And so Portland is a place that is, you know, full of the fervor of abolitionism and Thomas Sunrise is right there in the midst of that. And Reuben Ruby, this prominent abolitionist actually goes to the Amy Church in Portland. And then Sunrise continues his abolitionist work when he transfers to the Ohio Conference. So something that Thomas Sunrise does throughout his career is that he will give various talks and lectures about the merits of native history and culture. And he would often do so wearing Oneida regalia in part to encourage people to attend because a lot of folks wanted to see what the, what Oneida regalia looked like and to hear what he would have to say. So he does one such lecture in July of 1856. And remarkably, he does it to benefit some freedom seekers. So you can see here in this excerpt, the Reverend Thomas Sunrise will lecture this evening in Greenwood Hall, subject the manners and customs of the Indians with an account of their political and religious history, et cetera, et cetera. The proceeds to be used for the purpose of liberating an aged woman and a young mother and her three children. So here he is using his indigenous heritage, his indigenous knowledge to draw in a crowd and then using that to not only, you know, express his, you know, pride and uh, appreciation for his own heritage, but using that to help assist and support freedom seekers like these women. And you have to consider that if a young mother is running away with three small children, she must have been in a very desperate situation and Sunrise did what he could to help her. So Sunrise also shows his commitment to black freedom by attending relevant events. So for example, on August 1st, 1859, he participates in an event that marked the end of slavery in the British Caribbean 25 years before. So in 1834, Britain you know, ended slavery in its Caribbean colonies. And so this was you know, a, a moment of celebration for African-Americans in the United States who hoped that freedom would follow, follow them. And so in 1859, you see this event where this emancipation in the British Caribbean is being celebrated. And you can see Thomas Sunrise who attends. And he attends uh, wearing his Oneida regalia yet again. And so here you see him not only, you know, assisting in Ohio, assisting freedom seekers, but you see him celebrating the cause of black freedom by attending events like this one, which occurred in Pennsylvania in 1859. So even after emancipation, Sunrise continues to advocate for black people, giving numerous speeches in which he defends their rights and questions the genuine religiosity of white Christians. So for example, in one speech that he gives in Worcester, Massachusetts, he contends that the prejudice of the white race against the Indians and colored people was the greatest stumbling block in the way of the conversion of the masses of the Indian race to Christianity. So he's saying right here in front of all these uh, white uh, people attending this event that the way you treat us, the way you treat African-Americans, we're watching that. And there is no way you're going to get masses of indigenous people to convert to your religion when they see how you treat people. So he very much understood that African Methodism was not doing that, that African Methodism was about being welcoming of all people and that that was how you gain converts, not by discriminating against people and setting some apart from others. And so he gives speeches like this, these really bold speeches uh, all throughout his, his ministry and throughout his life. So finally, in conclusion, as I indicated at the very beginning of this presentation, Richard Allen's vision of African Methodism was not exclusive. Exclusive. It wasn't exclusionary. The African and African Methodist isn't meant to say that only people of African descent can be a part. Rather, his vision was multiracial, multi-ethnic, and it included indigenous people. And as evidence of that truth, you have Thomas Sunrise, this indigenous minister who clearly got that message and serves as an ordained minister in the AME Church. And so his story 
reminds us that the AME Church has been and continues to be far more diverse than we often think. So thank you very much for listening to this presentation. Uh, this is the purchase information for my book, and I'll put it up again if you would like to see it. So you can purchase the book on the University of Illinois Press website, and you can get a 30% discount by using the promo code I've included here, or you can purchase the book on amazon.com. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Christina, for that awesome presentation. Um, so much information, so enlightening. Um, I'm actually at a, uh, an advantage because I actually have the book and have read halfway through it and it is so engaging. I'm loving, I hate history, but you have made this so engaging that I can't put it down. So I'm grateful for your research. I'm grateful for you. And I wanna thank you so much for um, everything that you've done with this research. At this time, uh, Sister Joanne Griffin, who is a member of the Commission on Christian Education for Bridge Street Church, uh, she's going to come and engage in a dialogue with you about chapter two, because Joanne too has the book and um, has read uh, chapter two about uh, Sunrise's life. And she's going to come and talk about it with you. Um, and, you know, we're looking forward to it. While Joanne and Dr. Christina are dialoguing, um, I would ask that if you are listening to this conversation and if you have questions about anything that has been presented or any questions that kind of come up while the dialogue is happening, if you would please put them in the chat. Uh, this conversation is also on Facebook Live. So for those people who are live, if you can post them in the comment section uh, and we will give those questions to Dr. Christina once Joanne uh, and Dr. Christina have completed their dialogue. Joanne, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Thank you, Reverend Valerie. And um, good afternoon, Bridge Street family, uh, Pastor Cousin, um, Dr. Christina, and uh, Dr. Dickerson, and Sister Mary Dickerson, um, and all other guests that are on today. Um, uh, Reverend Valerie, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, as, a, as an aspiring historian myself, um, I am just um, appreciative of this opportunity to talk to Dr. Christina. We spoke briefly on the phone before, and um, this book is so fascinating. Um, I really, hmm, I just really don't know what to say, uh, Dr. Christina. I think what I appreciate about it the most, um, as for as far as I've gotten, um, is that you have spent a lot of time um, putting things into context. You've certainly filled a gap, um, information that we had no, some of us probably had no idea about. And so this, um, this book um, is certainly worth getting. The information is so um, detailed, is so rich. Um, and I can appreciate the amount of time that you spent gathering and um, putting this information together to share with um, the AME denomination. So um, Thomas Sunrise is certainly a, a compelling uh, character. Um, he, you know, you have showing us that he was, he preached throughout the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic. And this is of course, uh, certainly information I did not know. I don't know if anyone else knew about it. Um, but can you tell us um, first, though, about with the book, what made you even choose to research this topic? Yeah, well, so I went to Spelman for undergrad and graduated in 2004. My major was history. And then in the course of that study, I did learn Native American history. I took a course on that. And then after I graduated from Spelman, I went to, I took a year off uh, between undergrad and graduate school, and I started working in my father's office. So as Reverend Val indicated, my father is the retired uh, executive director of the Department of Research and Scholarship or the historiographer. And so while I was working in that office, uh, when I had off time, 
I would look at microfilm reels of the Christian recorder and just for fun, just to, to me, looking at those old reels was like being in a time machine. That's I consider it the closest thing we're going to get to a time machine. And so as I was just going through all the reels, I kept seeing all these references to the Indian Mission Conference, the Indian Mission Conference. And so I started doing research on what that was. And really over the course of years have, you know, just expanded my interest in the Amy Church and Indigenous people, because prior to that, I just did not know that there was a connection. Thomas Sunrise is someone who I found relatively late in my research process, as I was just scouring, you know, uh, old uh, annual conference minutes and old newspapers, and just kept coming across him and saying, oh, wow, he was an AME minister? Wait a minute. And then mm -hmm. I opened up, you know, uh, Daniel Payne's history of the Amy Church, and he's right there. He's right there in, mm -hmm. in that text. So, one of these people who's been hiding in plain sight for hundreds of years. And so there wasn't just kind of one thing that led me to this topic. It just all sort of built on uh, everything I kept learning over the course of many years. Thank you. So you titled this chapter, chapter two, Seeking Their Cousins. Can you, uh, and I know your last name is now cousin also, so I know, <laughs> I know there's no there. <laughs> but can you um, explain to us a little bit why you chose that title for um, that chapter, that particular I'm chapter? I'm so glad you asked that. I actually wanted that to be the title of the book. But, oh, okay. <laughs> because, so where that comes from is actually from John Hall, who I also talk about in that chapter. So, John, so we have Thomas Sunrise, this Oneida Amy minister, and John Hall is an Ojibwe AME minister. Mm -hmm. And John Hall, so he becomes an AME minister in the 1890s in Michigan. And so he attends you know, several AME annual conferences in Michigan. And so he gives these big speeches before the annual, before the annual conference in Michigan saying, you know, colored men are, are our cousins from old times, Native American, well, he says Indian, Indian people always saw colored men as our cousins. So I call you cousins. You are our cousins. You are our dear cousins. You are my brother cousin. We want our cousins to come to us. And so I really get that from him. He is the one who is defining the relationship between indigenous people and African-Americans as a familial one, as we are cousins. We are suffering the same things. He actually says that we suffer the same and we want to be with our cousins. And so I really take that phrase from him using this kinship language to describe the connection between indigenous people and African-Americans. But that's a great question. I'm so glad you asked. Okay, good, good. Um, so as I was reading further into the book, um, so we have Thomas Sunrise, who's in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic area. And then you tell us a lot about how um, the AME Church moves um, south and moves west um, to include more Native Americans. Um, I found interesting, it's another subject I did not know if I can go further into it, um, that Native Americans also held African Americans as slaves. So that was a big revelation for me. Um, and so can you, so I was kind of, um, you know, so now you say that, you know, they felt we were their cousins, but also that they um, had us but we know that some of them had us as, as slaves. So can you kind of explain, you know, if, if I had a little question about how that might've worked or how that did, even happened? Yeah, absolutely. So first it's important to note that there is great diversity within in the indigenous you know, communities, mm -hmm. that there are indigenous nations all over the country. So Thomas Sunrise is an Oneida from, you know, what we now call New York. Thomas Sunrise is an Ojibwe from Michigan. And then in the Southeast, you have the so-called five civilized tribes, the Cherokee, Creek, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Seminole, who did in fact own slaves, black slaves. And they did so because in part, because they wanted to prove to their white neighbors, to the US government, that they were as, you know, quote unquote, civilized as them. And therefore, you know, we are doing, you know, we're kind of going along with what you know, your culture is doing. So just leave us be and let us just stay on our land and 
we're going to kind of assimilate to what you are doing. And so part of that was owning black slaves and engaging in plantation agriculture and the market economy. And mm -hmm. so that was how they viewed uh, their way forward. So Thomas Sunrise's people do not do that. Uh, John Hall's people do not do that. So it's something that's somewhat unique to those five civilized tribes in the Southeast. Okay, so they pretty much followed um, what was happening as uh, far as um, what whites were um, practicing in the North and in the South. We know we have a lot of abolitionists that were in the North, white abolitionists from the North, and then those who were practicing um, slavery um, in the South. So we see that there's, you know, that connection. So um, I'm trying to think of what my question, um, so Thomas uh, Sunrise, so he was an abolitionist. He really did agree with all, you know, what was happening in the North. And then you had then um, those in the South, the Native Americans in the South then who were then mistreated by the whites, right? And then they were forced to move from where they were west can you talk some about that and then some about um the native the african americans that went along with them because many of them were their their slaves yeah absolutely so these five civilized tribes yes they do own african american as, as slaves and then in the 1830s this is a part of that removal era that i mentioned earlier in the presentation where the u.s government says okay yeah thanks for all that that civilizing you've done but we still want this land because the Southeast, that's Alabama, that's Georgia, that's all these places that happen to grow cotton very well. And mm -hmm. so they wanted that land that these indigenous people were on so that they could expand, you know, cotton agriculture and force black slaves to do that. And so they, you know, forced these five civilized tribes and other tribes, it's not just those in the Southeast, but they forced them off of their land and because they had these African-American slaves, those slaves had to go on that journey with them, this trail of tears to what is now Oklahoma, but was then called Indian Territory. And as the book talks about, it is a Annie Keel, who mm -hmm. was enslaved by Chickasaw people, who after emancipation, she wants to bring the Amy Church to her indigenous community because she mm -hmm. thinks this will you know, help her community move forward. So you have this, you know, really strong Amy connection there as well. Yes. So I know you, you say you argue, um, you, you really show great evidence um, that the AME church, um, you have this, um, the African, the Methodist African, the AME church movement West. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that some more? Um, you talked about Annie Keel. Um, so, and how the indigenous people were involved in the AME church moving West also. So you're referring to the, the African Methodist migration that I talk about? Correct, yes. Okay, so in the book, I make this, this argument about how the AME church is, you know, plays an important role in black migration to the West. So African-Americans want to leave the South for obvious reasons. The South is, you know, very difficult after emancipation and the, you know, the fall of reconstruction, there is just unbelievable violence. There is a strong attempt to prevent African-Americans from making any kind of strides. And so African-Americans certainly, you know, have plenty of motivations to leave. But what I argue in the book is that there's this additional motivation, this religious motivation. And what happens whenever an AME church is established? Okay. Let's say you establish a church in the Choctaw Nation, as is done in the 1870s. Well, once you have established that church, you have to find a pastor to go to that church. And oftentimes what the bishop will do is they will call on people from outside of that district to come and pastor that church. So, for example, when the church in the Choctaw Nation is established, Bishop Turner becomes the bishop over that. And he calls upon a minister from South Carolina named A.J. Miller to come and pastor that mm -hmm. church. And so that compels him to migrate west from South Carolina 
to Indian territory. And so we see that dynamic repeated over and over and over again throughout really, I say from the 1830s and up through uh, the early 20th century, where you see AMEs establishing churches and then the bishops having to supply pastor to the, pastors to those churches. And oftentimes those pastors come from out of district. And so they will migrate from their homes in the East and settle in the West. And so I argue that that is an additional impetus and motivation for Black Western migration. Okay, thank you. Um, two more questions I have for you. Uh, one is the book, how do you think, um, cause they always ask, I know with history, okay, so you're talking about this information. What does that have to do with what's going on in 2022? Mm -hmm. So can you uh, say what you would like people to get out of this book? Um, the information, how could we use it uh, in our current times, the Amy Church, our evangelism, you know, how can we use the information in this book? That's a great question. Well, what I hope that AMEs get out of this book is an appreciation for how much more expansive Richard Allen's vision was than we sometimes give him credit for. He did not only visualize this being a church for African Americans, and of course that, you know, that is a large part of it, and primarily African Americans have belonged to the church, but this church has always embraced people of different ethnicities and uh, different races, and we should take an appreciation of that in how we view ourselves today and not think it is strange that we have an AME church in India. Of course we have an AME church in India. Mm -hmm. Of course we have AME churches among various ethnicities throughout the African continent. Of course we, we have AME churches in England and France and all throughout Europe. Of course we do, because mm -hmm. that was Alan's vision. And so that is something we should you know, take seriously, that that really was, Alan, what, was what Alan was trying to do from the beginning. And we should you know, take him up on that. So if there is, you know, a, you know, a Latino community that could benefit from being in the Amy church, that's not outside of the realm of what is uh, reasonable for our denomination. That certainly is something we should look into doing. Is there a, you know, a Chinese American community that may want an Amy church? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing, you know, uh, off about that. That is very much in line with what Alan's initial vision was. So I would hope that Amy's take that from the book, that we can be more expansive in our vision of what the Amy Church can be. Great, thank you, thank you. And my last question, um, as my time is coming to an end, um, from a historian's point of view, how long did it take you to gather all of this information? Um, like I said, I can really appreciate, I can see the time that was spent. How long did it take you to gather all of this information and then complete writing the book? Well, I mean, it took years and the initial phases, um, I was, you know, of course I got married, I had two children, I have a job. And so I wasn't able to just exclusively only work on the book at any one time. So it's a little bit here, a little bit there. Uh, I got an ancestry.com subscription, which helped a lot. Uh, I have a newspapers.com subscription, which helped a lot because that has all kinds of uh, mm -hmm. materials that you can just look at. And if you have a minute, you know, 20 minutes one day, you can say, oh, let me just double check and see if there's anything in this newspaper. So, I mean, it took years, it took years. And it's the writing process and the publishing in an academic press, you know, that takes a long time. That is a long process. And so, I mean, it, it just, it took years. I mean, but it just, you know, it takes how long it takes. And I wanted to produce a book of quality that would be of, mm -hmm. you know, service to the denomination and it just takes how long it takes. And I'm happy with the product. I'm happy with the result. And hopefully everyone can get something out of it. Great. Thank you, Dr. Christina. I just really want to congratulate you on this. Um, I really appreciate, again, I can really see the work that was put into it. And I really appreciate how you contextualize everything. A lot of times we just get 
information. You know, you just get facts here and there, but a lot of times it's not put into the context of what else was happening at the time. So we get a full understanding of everything and one, how one thing really affected the other. So I really um, love this book. I'm gonna keep reading. Um, it's very fascinating. I will encourage everyone to get it um, if this is a topic that you're interested in. And as Reverend Valerie said, even if you're not interested, uh, in this topic. It's just a great book. And so um, I'm going to keep reading. And um, thank you so much for your presentation. And um, I look forward to talking to you again. <laughs> thank you for all your very thoughtful questions. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to turn back over to Reverend Valerie. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, you sound like me, Joanne. I'm texting her. I'm reading the book and I'm so excited and I'm texting Dr. <laughs> Christina like all times of day and night. And sometimes it's like a burning in my soul. I pick up the phone like, okay, Christina, so what in the ham and cheese is going on with this? <laughs> so I am so grateful that um, it, is, it, it can be a really great central discussion piece. Um, even during Super Bowl, um, you could just like... <laughs> You can talk about what was happening during that time. And I like, Joanne, that you asked the question, you know, how, how is the book relevant now? Um, one of the things that um, I asked Dr. Christina is, you know, if Richard Allen had this egalitarian thought process about um, the AME church, then why is it that um, we've had to struggle in so many ways right. to see that as a reality uh, mm -hmm. not only in our local churches, but connectionally. So, um, and a question that kind of came up, Dr. Christina, uh, in one of our Teaching Tuesdays, and our Teaching Tuesdays is a discipleship class that we have on Tuesdays. And a question that came up is about how do you see um, the church dealing with gender um, as part of that egalitarian concept that Richard Allen had for the AME church, especially people who are non-binary, who are bisexual, um, who are, um, you know, not considered uh, or not feeling like they're, they're part of the plan of God. Um, how do you think that factors into uh, that concept that Richard Allen had for the church? Well, I think it's something we certainly do have to interrogate. Sorry, my children are getting a little excited. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's something we certainly have to interrogate because Alan showed in his own life that his views could evolve. So mm -hmm. initially when Jarena Lee came to him, he said, you know, we don't call for women preachers, but after experiencing her, you know, preaching and getting up and, and being in the spirit, he, he was able to change and evolve. And so I think we should certainly take that as instructive and we too should interrogate ways in which we can grow, develop, evolve, because Christianity is about everyone and it's about including everyone and God loves everybody. And that's certainly something we should, you know, take seriously and, and think about. And I think we can see evidence in Alan's own life for how he handled that kind of issue. And then I think my last question to you before we move on to Reverend Monique is um, with regard to the evangelistic thrust, I think that Joanne's kind of hinted at earlier in her questioning, um, where do you see the AME church going? Um, the massive outreach that they had uh, in reading your book to the uh, Indian or indigenous populations, how, what, where do you see us uh, doing something like that? Like who is that population now? I would say certainly among Latino populations, for example. I remember when uh, we were at our first church, Mount Zion Bridgeton in Bridgeton, New Jersey, there was a really you know, vigorous and, and active uh, Latino population there. And it would have made you know, a lot of great sense to you know, continue doing outreach among those communities. And I think that's certainly something we can look into today. I also think we have so many uh, immigrant communities from throughout the diaspora coming to the United States. You know, Haitian immigrants coming to the United States, Dominican immigrants coming to the United States, all kinds of different ethnicities, people from all throughout the African continent. And yes, they have, you know, different cultures than us. Some of them speak different languages than us, 
but certainly that is something that should be looked at and they should be incorporated into the fabric of our denomination. And could we be making more efforts towards those communities who would be you know, receptive to, to our denomination? So I certainly think that's something we should look into. And again, I think there's evidence just in Amy history for us doing that. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that in your book, you talked about how Thomas Sunrise sort of brokered a relationship um, between the AME church and his community. And he used the AME church to further that um, in that uh, Richard Allen uh, was very intentional about making sure that AME preachers were learned, that they knew the King's English, that they went through the uh, Institute and did everything that they could do to make sure that they were um, the best they could be in you know, sharing the gospel. Um, but I also think that Sunrise uh, used that to his advantage to broker things to his community because of the language barrier of his people. Can you kind of speak to that a little bit? Well, I see, I see that a bit more with, with John Hall because he, he's the one who really does evangelize among you know, Potawatomi people and other Ojibwe people. And he, yeah, so he, he is able to be this go-between uh, and he's able to share with them what he is getting out of this denomination where on the, you know, just someone mentioning, hey, I joined an AME church, maybe his community would say, what is that? Why would you do that? But with him able to, being able to articulate what the AME church offers, you can certainly see that having an impact. So him talking about how, you know, colored people are our cousins. They have been our cousins for however many years. And here they have founded this organization that is entirely run by them. And if you are interested in becoming a Christian, why not become a Christian among your own cousins who actually run the show as opposed to joining, you know, a, a different denomination where you're being, you know, governed by whites. And so he's able to make that compelling case and really get adherence to, to go along with that as well. So obviously it was an attractive message to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then finally, really finally, <laughs> um, <laughs> the um, spiritedness of worship in the AME denomination. Can you speak to that and why that attracted Sunrise? Well, it, it's really more John Hall who says this, but he says that it was when we want to worship the great spirit and you know that excitement comes into our hearts if we're worshiping among white people they tell us to take that outside and don't do that here but among our cousins we can express ourselves in that way and so just based on what he is saying he is indicating that there is more of a uh, a more expressive worship experience among african americans than among the whites who he had been among, and that that was another attractive element of the Amy Church, that there is this, you know, vigorous uh, worship that at least John Hall, that he could identify with, that he could recognize, and how he and his people were more comfortable worshiping the great spirit, as they would call uh, God. And so, yeah, so they, they certainly, you know, I'm not putting this in his mouth, this is what John Hall himself said, that that is what he saw in African Methodism. Okay, thank you. And thank you so much, Joanne. Great dialogue, truly enjoyed it. At this time, Reverend Monique is going to come and she's going to share with you any questions that were posted in the chat or on Facebook while you were dialoguing with um, Sister Joanne. Hi, good afternoon, Dr. Dickinson Cousin. This is fantastic. I'm enjoying this so much as I'm sure everyone else is as well. There've been a couple of questions in the chat. The first one is from Linda Jones who asked, what were the last known whereabouts of Thomas Sunrise? And in perhaps an associated question, Annette Smith has asked, was Thomas Sunrise married? Did he have children? And does his legacy live on? That is, those are both really great questions. So firstly, from what I was able to glean, he spends you know, the latter years of his life in New England. I don't have an exact date for when he passed or where he passed, but the last place I found him was in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts in the 1890s. So presumably he continues to live in New England until he passes probably sometime in the, in the 1890s, maybe in the early 1900s. I don't know if he was married or had children. 
the materials that I have just do not reveal that information. There's no indication that he was married or had children. Uh, it's entirely possible that he did, but just the resources that I looked at did not give an indication of that. And in terms of does his ministry live on, I, I don't know. I think it would be interesting to maybe reach out to the Oneida Nation and see if they know anything about him or if they've heard anything about him. Uh, that certainly would be something I would be interested in doing because I think it would be fascinating to see if there is more of a lasting legacy than I'm even aware of. Thank you. That is something interesting to think about. Who knows that may be the next step in uh, more collaborations cross-culturally, as you said. Another question that we have is from Calvin Patterson, who asked, did Thomas Sunrise express any sentiments about Native American ownership of African Americans as enslaved people? Another wonderful question. I have not seen anything that he said specific to that, but my you know, strong suspicion is that he would have been opposed to it. Uh, he was you know, very much uh, in favor of abolition. I don't think he would have had much you know, patience for uh, slaveholding among any indigenous nation. I think he would have said that this is you know, very much against what uh, we should be doing. We are all oppressed people here and we should be helping each other out, not enslaving each other. But I don't have any specific evidence of him saying that. But my strong suspicion is that he would have been opposed to it. I see. And we have a final question from Patricia Wright, who wrote in the chat, today the church still struggles with issues related to true inclusion. Your book shows that Thomas Sunrise had an on again, off again membership in the AME church and an often contentious relationship with other AME ministers. Did those relationships and interactions result in any recorded changes in the processes used by the AME church to bring non-African American members into the church? Not that I know of. It seems as though the issues that he has with the AME church it's these, these couple of ministers who he just doesn't get along with. He, because he does eventually return to the AME denomination in the 1870s and 1880s, that certainly indicates that he wasn't opposed to African Methodism. He just had an issue with these couple of people. And even when he leaves the AME church for those you know, couple of decades, he still, like he, he joins the AME Zions for a while. So he still has that desire to be among independent black churches, he just had an issue with those individual people. So that I know of, uh, there was no, you know, fundamental, you know, law passed or, or anything to, to try to regulate that. It seemed like just an interpersonal issue, as far as I can tell. Okay, well, I want to thank you for uh, supplying so much really rich information. And thank you to everyone who posted their questions in the chat. At this time, Dr. Dickinson Cousin, if there are any closing remarks that you'd like to make, uh, you certainly have the floor. Thank you so much. Well, I just want to extend uh, another thank you again to Bridge Street Amy Church, to my aunt and uncle, uh, Dr. David Cousin, Reverend Valerie Cousin, for extending this invitation and trusting me with, with your wonderful, beautiful congregation. Thank you to the whole Bridge Street family. Thank you to uh, Joanne Griffin. Thank you to uh, Reverend Monique for asking such wonderful questions and just thank you everyone for your support. I It really has meant so much to me that the book has been embraced this way among uh, the AME church. I've been an AME my entire life and I certainly want to make this denomination proud and to just show how rich and brilliant our history is. Oftentimes we ourselves put African Methodism in a box about what it is and what it has been. And I hope what this book shows is that we are so much more, so much more complicated, so much more nuanced, so much more visionary than we even give ourselves credit for. So thank you all so much for supporting me and supporting this book. Thank you to my husband, Stephen, who is keeping our kids out of the room. <laughs> thank you so much for your support. And just thank you everyone for coming out on Super Bowl Sunday of all days to, to hear me talk about this topic. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Christina, Reverend Monique, uh, Sister Joanne. At this time, uh, we're gonna ask Pastor Cousin to come and give us closing remarks. All right, big cheer to our niece, yay! Outstanding presentation today. And this certainly was more exciting than any Super Bowl. 
especially when the New York teams are not involved, <laughs> right? Again, kudos to our niece for a wonderful presentation today. And uh, I just love that name, Thomas Sunrise. There's just something about that name, Thomas Sunrise. And as you were speaking and being so uh, profound uh, in the uh, historical uh, aspect of our denomination, I can appreciate the way that you lifted out that we are uh, inclusive and not exclusive. And that means so very, very much. And as you were speaking also, uh, I reflected on the position of Richard Allen um, having an, uh, a, a, a wonderful ministry of inclusion in relationship to really being involved about uh, the spirit of the free and universal grace of a loving God, the free and universal grace of a loving God. So again, congratulations. Thank you for hanging out with Bridge Street for a little while today. Thank you to uh, Reverend Valerie and to Sister Joanne, Reverend Monique and all who made this possible. And uh, I heard uh, Sammy back in the background back there. It sounded like Sammy was doing a little preaching himself. I don't know if it was Stevie or Sammy. Which one was it, Stephen or Sammy? Which one? It was Sammy trying to break into the room and Stevie trying to stop him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Well, again, thank you so very much. And thank you, Bridge Street family. And uh, we're looking for volume two, volume three, volume four, volume five, and many more many more wonderful writings. And again, God bless and keep you. And thank you for sharing with us this day. Thank you, Pastor Cousin. So on behalf of Pastor Cousin, the Commission on Christian Education, I would like to personally thank you for coming on, um, Dr. Christina today, and for all of our online and church community for sharing with us in this conversation. We hope you enjoyed the dialogue and we look forward to sharing in many, many more conversations with you um, in the future. Thanks again, Dr. Christina, Reverend Monique, Sister Joanne, and let me not forget the tech team, Natalie Williams, Jai Cooper, and Suwani Dworko for making this conversation possible and for giving us food to feast on for the Black History Month, uh, for this, our Black History Month and throughout the year. Thank you again, everyone. Be blessed and have a wonderful day in the Lord. And thank you, Dr. Dickinson. I saw your dad on here and your mom, Sister Mary. Thank you all for coming on. So appreciative.